Hi everybody and welcome to Aquamarine. We are being joined today by the lovely Emma Woodcock from Grace and Abel. Hi Emma. Hi, hi. <laughs> so Emma is an amazing, amazing person. She has an incredible uh, business backstory of um, all these wonderful things that she uh, did before she founded Grace and Abel and I'm going to get her to tell us a little bit about that um, but then she has gone on to found this absolutely beautiful fair trade uh, jewelry business and we of course stock um, some of her gorgeous collection at aquamarine I'm even wearing one of her necklaces today this is the diner necklace so you can looks see lovely lovely it looks it's very chic and uh, very classical um, so Emma just wow you're an, such an inspiration why don't you go ahead and um and tell everybody a little bit about your background and and how you came to found uh, grace and abel sure so um trying to make a long story quite short um <laughs> in a nutshell i was uh born in new zealand but we were brought up in the philippines where my my father was working in microfinance for many years and he still in fact does um and so I think I always had that awareness in my upbringing. I didn't come to Australia until I was 12 years old. So a lot of my fundamental sort of formative years were done in a, a developing country, um, which um, as a teenager, I thought was a real curse. <laughs> I couldn't relate. No, no one, I didn't watch TV for 12 years. And so I couldn't oh relate my goodness. culturally. <laughs> yeah. But um, as an adult, I see it as a real blessing. Um, and then... As a young person, you know, when you're 21, kind of finishing uni, not sure what you want to do, I head off, headed off to England, like all backpackers around here do. Yeah. Um, and I met my husband and married and lived in England for nearly eight years. And it was during this time I came across some decorative Christmas decorations that were um, made in the Philippines and I was really excited to see something of my past and so I started like trying to find out more about it um, first off I became annoyed with the shop she didn't know her product line she hadn't even known where she bought them from wow. and so uh, I'm a bit of this yeah I know <laughs> so many people are so disconnected from the the um the source you know the 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 uh, production line as you say and and, yeah. and have absolutely no idea past well I bought them from you know the wholesaler but yeah they, they don't think beyond that I think it's no. changing but yeah it's still definitely a lot I, of people like that. I do and then I think just on a general business level if you're selling something you need to know that product so um, on, even if you're not um, ethically minded or passionate about fair wages or whatever that that's not necessarily an issue but just to know your business, to be able to sell your product, you have to have product knowledge. So yeah. um, from a, just from a customer service point of view, I was pretty, <laughs> pretty amazed. And so I started tracking it down and traced it back to one of the tribal villages that my father had worked with and that, you know, yeah. I had sat and played in those streets and with their children. Um, and it broke my heart because the more I traced it, the worse I realized the wages on the production line were. So I knew that these were families um, that I had mixed with that would not see what I was seeing or would not see what the shop owner was seeing profit wise from that. Mm. And it became, at that time I was working as an interior designer. I had my own interior design firm um, and I was just doing that sort of thing. And it became such a burning issue within me um, that, um, it formed the seed of Grace and Abel about 14 years ago. So, yeah, <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah. And so how, how long did it take for that, um, that burning seed to become such a big fire that you just had to do something about it? Yeah, well, there was a lot that happened. in. So I've been running Grace and Abel for four years. So in that 10 years between, like, it really was planted in my soul to becoming reality four years ago I had um, a lot of different things I had um, two children I <laughs> brought my family and my husband I brought my husband he chose we worked together <laughs> and we came <laughs> we came back and decided to live in Australia um, and so there was like that big cultural shift in people don't think it's cultural because you know we're the same skin color and things like that but there are a lot of little things to adjust to that are quite different 
Um, and so we did all that. Um, and then it was after my second child was probably uh, coming up to his second birthday that I thought, no, this is time. Like I can't ignore it <laughs> anymore. I was really scared because um, even though I'd done my interior design business and also been working as a visual merchandiser, freelancing just for little boutiques doing visual merchandising, I still didn't have a great deal of business knowledge or, um, and you know, you can listen to the doubts and get really uh, caught up in, in thinking that you're not enough or who are you to make one. And I didn't even know where to begin with it. So um, it, was, it was very daunting, but I took a step, I took a giant leap, it felt like for me. And uh, this is the result. So Grace Enables here for four years and slowly I'd, um, just building it up into something steady and sustainable. That is fantastic. So, I mean, how did you actually go about starting it? Because it's quite, uh, and, and tell, tell everybody a little bit more about Grace and Abel and, and sure. how, what you do. Okay. So, yeah, it's probably important to say that Grace and Abel is an accessory brand that we are actually producers. So, um, I work directly with the artisans. I design the jewellery here um, and collaboratively with the, design, with the artisans. Um, and, um, and then... So we, so there's no one else making the jewellery or those designs. It's quite unique. Um, and I use the traditional skills that they have been passing down through generations um, and we bring them into a contemporary uh, result. So like the necklace you're wearing is actually made out of paper beads um, and they print the colour that we're choosing for each collection onto magazine paper, recycled magazine paper. Really? Then, That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, and then they roll it up by hand and then they dry it and varnish it. So the whole process to make a necklace like yours is quite time consuming because the varnishing and drying takes three days itself and then they have to break that up before they even th weave the different designs of jewellery from necklaces to earrings to bracelets. But it's all completely handmade. So every part of the process from the rolling of the beads to the checking of the varnish to the tying on the clasps at the end it's all completely done by um by hand and by artisans in uganda and kenya now kenya doesn't do the paper beads kenya does the brass jewelry yeah. that we stock and the brass jewelry again is a sustainable jewelry where we get um we source through another independent business um broken padlocks broken tapware broken brass pieces and then the artisans in kenya melt that down into casting shapes or into um, brass sheets and we make the jewellery from there. Well, so, yeah. are you wearing some of those earrings? Yeah, I'm wearing some from the new collection that launched um, last Thursday. And these these are called the um, Nanga earrings, they're anchors. And then also there's um, just trialling some rings now. So. Oh, cool. Everybody. <laughs> now I better adjust these. <laughs> um, so that's, so that's, what I love about it, I love being able to work on the real grassroots level and why the artisans are doing all that. Um, I work with different organisations and myself and we go in and we provide them development training from literacy and numeracy skills to uh, health and wellbeing projects um, to other income projects and also financial management. So the whole thing is a real uh, holistic way to create paths out of poverty. Yeah. Um, I, I uh, one, because you're actually working directly with them on, on creating a sustainable business that yes. is not only sustainable in terms of using sustainable materials like recycling and, and all the yes. rest, but you're teaching them how to um, sustain their own communities and families through That's the right. business that they're creating. I just, I just think it's such a wonderful, like completely, um, yeah, close to my heart what you're doing. Yeah, yeah it's very close. Like, I guess the impact of the Philippines really never left me. And um, I'm quite passionate about social justice and quite aware that my privilege only comes from where I was born and I could have easily been born to a different family. And so I feel very passionate about using my privilege to pay it forward. Um, sorry, my earpiece keeps falling out. Um, and yeah, and I, I bring that to the I encourage that to the artisans. I encourage them to do projects that um, pay it forward as well. So it's a very community thing as well. So 
Oh, that's so cool. So yeah. they're, they're also sort of seeing themselves as being um, in a position to be able to, uh, to help others too, which is, which is wonderful because I'm sure, you know, a few years ago before they started working with Grace and Abel, they would not or may not have seen themselves that way at all. No. And I mean, we're talking about uh, real below poverty line people here. They, they, um, one of the things we're doing is working on um, improving their living standards. So eventually we're con um, concreting their floors for a start, but many of them don't like just renting their home. So you have to go through like talk, networking and, and talking to the homeowner about concreting floors. So everything takes a long time yes. in Africa to get done. You can't just go, this is a great idea. I'm going to do it. You have to go through the proper customs and proper respect way um, so yeah so we're looking at improving their lifestyle quality but then making them aware that they're change makers as well and yeah. and that they can bring that into their community they can pay it forward they can look after people um, yeah. it's important to state that my artisans are not my employees they are their own independent business yeah. I think that's really important because um, it means they're empowering themselves they're still not relying on a white person to bail them out Yes. And so when they run their own business, I come alongside very um, much as a partner on an equal level. And I think part of the problem with poverty is that they see themselves as lesser and yeah. they don't see equality with, with, um, the develop, uh, with our country or even what we have. We have plenty and they don't. So there's a real level of inequality going on. So I yes. try and work in a way that makes, I'm just pointing out that I'm exactly the same we're in this together <laughs> yeah i love that you know the fact that you're empowering them to to um to really see that uh, well through this this engine if you like of the business that they can begin to gather their own momentum and and you know drive their own situation forward and up and and out yeah. of poverty, yeah. which is just yeah. wonderful um, yeah so how did you actually go about finding these people to work with? Was that a difficult and time consuming journey? Did you just kind of go randomly traveling around <laughs> and you found people? Or? No, no, it took a, a lot of prayer because as a mum of two young children, I don't have a lot of time to just um, do the beautiful traveling around the world as much as my heart yearns for it at times. Yeah. Um, and so no, what happened was I have a very dear, friend, mentor, just inspirational woman who um, is the CEO of a charity out there that is actually an orphanage, well, was an orphanage. Um, UN around the world started changing orphanages a couple of years back because of such systemic abuse in orphanages. And she started working closely to lead the change um, into uh, working with social workers to find the next of kin, because many of the children in orphanages are not orphans at all. Um, and so she changed her charity from being an orphanage into a vocational training center. And one of the um, problems she had was she couldn't, the, all the staff she had when she was at orphanage then didn't have places with her um, right. to continue being employed with her. And so she, I started talking to her about my dream of uh, running a, a business that everything was connected you knew where it came from you knew your production line you could you knew the person behind your product um, and she said well I do have this one woman in, in Uganda that I have to let go um, but my heart I just love her as a person and my heart's really for her and I don't know what will happen if I let her go um, would you she works with all the single mothers in her village to make jewelry but they just make this jewelry and then it sort of sits there and they don't get to sell it or it goes to markets. But if you go to a market in Uganda, there's a lot of women selling jewellery. Right. So um, she said, can you come out? Can you just spend two weeks and we'll see what you can do? Um, so I went out and stayed with her at the orphanage um, and saw what she did and how she worked, which became really instrumental into respecting the culture and just... Um, learning how to do things with a great deal of respect in another country um not bulldozing your way in because you think your way's the best so it was all sorts of humbling to watch her work and like just a huge learning curve and it was that i spent two weeks um with winnie my ma my manager out there getting to know her and then at the end of it i came home and set up grace and abel and said there's got to be more for it than me just advising her how to sell at the market or 
to reach the boutique shops at the resorts through on the River Nile kind of thing. I said, there's yeah. got to be more for her. So Grace and Abel was founded out of that two weeks, realising that I can bring power to the Australian consumer. That means, yeah. you know, that we can make our... Like, I just think that we work so hard to earn our money, we should also, once we spend it, still make it work hard. Yes. Um, so. <laughs> gives me goosebumps. It actually just yeah. makes me cry. Ah, <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I've cried a lot <laughs> in the past four years <laughs> over big it's things. So I mean, true. it's so true. And, I, you know, just uh, because um, money, uh, it, it's, it's just energy, isn't it? And, mm -hmm. um, and if we direct it like the, like the water of a river, a great river, if we, if I, if we can direct it in such a way that it, brings good to, to everybody that it touches all the way down the line. And what a wonderful world we would have. I know, right? And they say money is powerful. Well, let's make it be properly powerful. Like, let's not yeah. make it just feed the greedy or the corporate. Yeah. So like, it's not that I have a problem with them. Like, they are there for a reason and we can learn a lot from them. But we can, all things can be done with integrity, I believe. So. Yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, money can be powerful, but let's use it to empower the people yes. who are not in power and, you know, powerless in our yes. society. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that was the uh, African side of things. What about yep. the, um, the, the Philippines? Yes. Yeah, so the Philippines um, is still in development. It's a lot harder because um, uh, there's a lot more competition with, um, they've got more access. So like they've got internet, they've got a huge history of having America there. So they often look to America before they will look to Australia for solutions. And yeah. America approaches business quite differently than Australians do. So it's a bit harder in some ways to get going. Um, and I've come up against problems time and time again. So like for well, one example is um, next, working with a group of women to get going at the moment and they want computers to manage their business and I'm like great you can we will put that into your pro program or we'll look at you know going forward that can be a goal and you know the partnership of your business you'll be able to get computers out of that and then you'll have earned them and you know it will be a real success and taste so sweet for you because you will have run the business to get there um and then they're also in talks with Americans who are like yeah no problem we'll ship some it is to you <laughs> so it's kind of like oh I'm gonna lose because I'm trying to get them to do it for themselves or you know or m talking about micro fin fin financing loans for them to yeah. get the computers so there's some level of accountability but um, so there's a lot of different things that go on but we're still in talks with the Philippines and to see what's going on there um, yeah my, my father's very much involved in this um, microfinancing in the food industry so although we're very similar in a lot of our philosophies and what we do we actually don't work together because we're very parallel right <laughs> yeah he keeps telling me to get into the food industry and I'm like one one retail battle at a time <laughs> <laughs> and um so obviously you're a, a wholesaler and that was how mm -hmm. I, I found you because I actually found mm -hmm. you at um, the Reed uh, gift fair in, was that January or February this year? February. Yeah. 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 And just so, <laughs> so excited to find you. <laughs> um, and, and in I, fact, I stopped first because of the beautiful uh, jewelry and, yeah. uh, you know, and then when I found out the story behind it, I was, I was blown away. Um, yes, I remember meeting you there. Um, <laughs> that was actually the launch of wholesale. So up until February, I had just been direct to customer online and through workshops. Okay. Um, and so um, I was aware that I wanted to create Grace Enable into a, a wider reaching brand and bring that, um, what I term powerful purchases to the consumer throughout Australia. Um, and there's only so much reach you can have through workshops or through online. Um, yeah. And the online e-commerce, it's so competitive. It's very hard to, to um, get going there. But um, so I, I sought some advice and we felt that um, Grace and Abel would work really well for wholesale just in terms that each piece comes with a tag of the artisan and a little bio. So you're really connecting the story. Um, and it's that human interest that are, is really well and stands out on the shelf and things like that. So, um, 
yes, I launched in February, but that that was a whole learning curve doing a training show. And yeah. I realize now, you know, like my whole, my just my philosophy was very different. I didn't make my store look like a shop like many of the other people did. I had it looking like an art gallery. It was so different. But I don't regret anything. It was a great learning curve. And hopefully um, next year I'll be able to do another trade show or two. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, it certainly caught our attention. So, you know, that's, yeah. <laughs> you, weren't, you yeah. weren't doing anything wrong as far as I could tell. No, exactly. And, and I think that's been part of the, the learning curve is to realise that you're not for everyone and that you will speak to who you need to and to really stay true to that core of who your customer is and, and not worry about this because it's so overwhelming when you're getting, you know, even online or even when you start looking at your competitors who, who might actually have a slightly different customer target than you, you can easily get caught up in like, oh, I'm not doing enough or whatever, but you've really got to come back to that core and the right people will find you and that's what matters. Even if it's a slower um, business journey, yeah. in the end, when you realise why you're doing what you're doing, it, it's better to have that slower journey because it's more authentic. Yeah, and, and when you really find your tribe. <laughs> yeah, your tribe. <laughs> <laughs> the, people, the people who are, you know, deeply passionate supporters who, who are going to really kind of help to, to push it yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, do you have stockists in Australia only or are you looking to stock, um, you know, in the UK? And, and Yes, no, I'm very open to in, um, international stockists. I'm in talks with a couple of places in New Zealand at the moment. Um, I'm, um, I'm in Tasmania, I'm in South Australia and I'm in Victoria, obviously trying to get into all states. So all inquiries welcome. <laughs> um, but yeah, it definitely interested in to reaching into the UK. It's like a second home for me. And I think there's a place there for Grace and Abel, but, um, yeah, just trying to take it a step at a time because as I scale up, I have to be mindful. I have to scale my artisans up. Yeah. And while it would be really easy to rush forward and scale up Grace and Abel here. It might be overwhelming to my artisan. So it's, it's like a two step dance all the way. <laughs> yes. Oh gosh. Cause it's, you know, that's the whole thing. It's, it's artist produced, not mass produced. So yes. for yep. them to be able to keep up with uh, the production demand, I guess yes. is, um, is quite an important part of the whole process. It is an important part of them learning their business journey as well about scalability and, and what that means and how that grows them. Yeah. yeah. And so you actually go out there and coach them, um, don't you, and hold workshops with them about not yes. just about the business, but about other things like feminine hygiene and, and things That's like that. That's true. Yeah. Tell, tell us more about that. Yeah, so I try to go out once a year um, and then in, in between time I um, work with different organisations that are like-minded that can do a lot of uh, training and, and reach to the artisans that I can't do. Um, but over um, International Women's Day and Mother's Day this year, we were able to do a um, starting of the Women's Health and Wellbeing Project um, and uh, give them, we were able to give them some um, washable sanitary kits um, which sounds like, oh, that's no big deal. But if you, like, I sat down and I was talking with my manager and I said, well, what are your needs? What's going on? Where can we make some improvements in your lifestyle? And she said, well, we're losing the artist, the women artisans, because um, I do work with men as well. It's not fully women. Yeah. Um, but we're losing the uh, women artisans for about four or five days a month. Um, and then when you look at that over a year, um, well, that affects the production they're able to give me as a brand here, but it also affects their income and their livelihood. So I started talking to her. I said, how do you manage it? And the stories that were coming back were so horrific. You know, they were using not just dirty old rags, but more than that, some of them were actually using cow patties. <laughs> and so, so it, it, it was... Um, it was heartbreaking for me to hear that. Like I just couldn't oh. imagine. And I thought there's more like we instinctually sort of know that the hygiene about that is just really bad, but they don't, they are just so desperate and so oppressed that they weren't even aware that that would be damaging to their health oh and they could be picking God. up stuff. So I realized it was just more than just giving them a kit and saying, this is what you use. Um, but it was also about teaching them about how to manage it, how to stay clean um, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And so I put my uh, manager winning through some training 
And then she was able to teach the women um, when she introduced the kit. She was not only able to teach them how to wash it and keep it um, hygienic, but also for them how to um, manage it in between and just how to keep cleanliness going and, and just be hygienic. Um, not saying that they're not, but they have limited access um, so to water and things like that. So it was just about, you know, overall, this is, you know, this is damaging to your health. This is how you, you live. And yeah. then um, about two weeks after that, we were all also got a hold of some women's health booklets printed in the local language. These are the comics um, done out for the sort of teenage girls. And so Winnie went to the community and got all their daughters and the young girls in the village um, and was able to bring the same training to these girls that are going into starting puberty and things like that. Oh, that's just so beautiful. I mean, gosh, what a life-changing thing, to, a gift to be able to, to give them. And, I mean, you know, just so much that we take for granted here and, and just don't even realize you know, I know. Because you just we're so naive and thinking that in this day and age well everybody must have access to feminine hygiene products and know what to do with them but no I mean still half the world doesn't half, yeah and and I mean it's not to say they don't they can go to the like the nearby town which has the shops and buy it but it's so out of their price range yeah. for them to consider buying it that and then it's got it's like well if I buy this that means my children go without or we go without meals for four nights yeah. or you know so the cost of it um, goes down to they'd rather feed their children and look after their families and themselves and yeah um, it's yeah it was so many it was, mothers do so so many mothers I mean even in our culture you know mothers are, are terrible for putting themselves last and putting everybody yeah. else first yeah, exactly exactly I mean I do it like if if you know, I, I might see something I like or want to shop or, you yeah. know, who need new shoes. But if the kids need new shoes before I do, I do it. And the only difference is I know it's not a long wait till I can um, then sort myself out. Then yeah. it, it might not come around again. So yeah. um, it was a very humbling project, very, um, very amazing to be part of it. But, yeah, really important that it came from my artisans too, like, I was really happy because there was talk of me going out and doing the training, but I really wanted it to be from my artisans to my artisans in the community. Yes. So yeah, I was just able to sort of watch on the bylines and just yes. be really humbled by the whole process. So. Oh, how fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's someone said to me the other day, how do you define success and I'm like well that's it like <laughs> that's it when you can do those things it's not so much about whether I can I'm in the red or in the black or if my bank about count for balancing this month or not or whatever that is I mean that all weighs heavily on on your shoulders as well but um when you think about it you know you, these are what you go okay this is what I'm working towards and this is what it's all about and that, this that's is right. what success is yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, because your your business is just so closely connected to your why, you yes. know, that greater human um, goal of, of trying to create equality, I guess, and um, and, and redress the balance there. Yeah. Which, yeah. yeah, which your business is working every day to, to achieve that. And, and it's just so wonderful to know that, you know, as a woman, you can, you can wear um, a piece of jewellery that's not only beautiful, but that feels so beautiful knowing that it is helping another woman to create a beautiful life for herself. I yeah, just, totally. Such a fabulous, fabulous. It's almost like, you know, kind of wearing a, a, a proud badge of honour to say, look, I'm helping somebody else. Fantastic. <laughs> Feel yourself, you know. One of the things I, I was drawn to doing something in the fashion industry was to reach women because I know how bad I am at taking a compliment. Like if someone says, oh, I really love what you're wearing or you look nice and that, I kind of quickly brush away or run to the next room. And I thought, oh, hang on, you know, we need to create space to actually take that on and say, yeah, I do. But also knowing that there's a story behind it immediately means we can take that compliment on and then shift into the story of it. So we don't have to get too uncomfortable. But then there is something we can talk about, about why they're complimenting complimenting yes. us and I think you know just to connect with who's behind what you're 
it gives you a greater sense of purpose and passion as well about what you're actually bringing into your home or what you're actually putting on your body. We're yeah. very aware of what we can put into our body, how we consume, what's healthy of us. And that's very um, one of the fortunate blessings we have in Australia, but we're not so aware about what we're putting on us. Yes. So, Yes, yeah. I 100% agree. Uh, yeah. I, think, um, I think it is slowly, slowly starting to change in Australia, but we are lagging behind definitely um, yeah. Europe and, uh, and and other places where, you know, they're becoming much, much more conscious of um, of the whole sort of ethical fashion movement and, and that yeah. kind of thing. Um, yeah, I really see a cusp happening in Australia and it's really exciting. I think there's a wave yeah. building and it, it's good, it's good though. I think Australia can be quite powerful, so oh, bring absolutely. it on. Yeah, I mean, once once everybody does start to shift their mindset towards that and, you know, we're, we're such a lucky country and we always, you know, sort of refer to Australia as a lucky country, but it's so true. Um, yeah. We're in such a power, uh, such a position of power to be able to, you know, as consumers, conscious consumers, to um, to really make a difference with our purchases. Uh, yeah. We, if we start to really think about, you know, where things come from and, and how they're made. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, when well, we've got things like Emma Watson, um, the other Emma. <laughs> yeah, the other Emma. <laughs> oh, nice to be up on that level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, she was on the cover of Vogue Australia recently talking about yes. um, ethical fashion. And, you know, so it is starting to infiltrate, isn't it, which is, it is. Really fantastic. And I hope that that knock-on effect is going to, you know, um, translate into more sales for, for Grace and Abel and, you know, for you. you guys to be able to grow and for your communities to be able to to grow their production processes organically and uh, and comfortably and you know um it's just it's just wonderful so uh so Thank what's you. you what's what's on the horizon for grace Nable? okay so we just launched a new collection was it thir last thursday which is really exciting so it's more um deeper dual tones for winter just going into some of those comforting winter tones really yeah, um so beautiful yeah really beautiful and i just enjoy the privilege of being able to work with color so easily um and so that's just released um now so we're getting that into store and into into our customers hands and it's being so far being re received really well yeah. um there's a couple of development projects happening overseas but that could take a long time <laughs> like it's it's such grassroots networking that um it does take a while to get things up and going but we're looking at doing like i mentioned one in the philippines and also one in bali so there'll be expansion there and we're also um i'm also looking at bringing more homewares to grace and Abel and just exploring because there's my artisans are very skilled and there's a lot more they can do than just the jewelry. So um, we're just sort of working through that. What will that look like? How will that look like? Um, do they have the time? How can they expand to manage that? Um, so yeah, so those are the things that we're answering now to grow Grace and Abel. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it never stops. <laughs> no, it never stops. But it I mean, such a, such a rewarding journey and, you know, and, and just so wonderful to, to talk to another like-minded soul. I know. <laughs> it really helps because I think when you're running your business, I'm sure you can speak that for ACMA aquamarine at times it gets lonely or you just get so up in your head that you really need to know where your like-minded people are to go and have a conversation with and just think yeah i'm not so crazy <laughs> no and for the people watching it's quite nice because emma and i actually live just one suburb away from each other so it is it is although we don't see each other that often for doing that i know we definitely need to catch up for another coffee again really soon <laughs> that would be great yes yes and all welcome anyone in melbourne is welcome <laughs> yes yeah that'd be great if anybody else is coming down this way we're, we're on the mornington peninsula that's right <laughs> that's right um so everyone i'm going to put the links uh in the uh in the article so you'll be able to see um you know how to get to the grace and Abel website uh if you are just wanting to purchase some beautiful jewelry for yourself or a gift for a friend um and there are some nice homewares like some baskets and things like that there as well that we don't actually stock in at, at aquamarine because they're not so coastally designed they're more of a different sort of style but you might love them um 
so so you can go and have a look at those and then of course uh in our aquamarine store we've got a selection of um some of the pieces that are just beautiful coastal kind of colors yes beautiful uh, colors yeah so you can you can find those there as well and uh and make sure you you sign up to the grace enable newsletter because emma um always sends out lots of interesting articles as well and and information you. about what she's been doing and you can yep. follow the journey and and find out more about what the beautiful artisans are, are doing and uh and all their new collection and all that sort of thing as well yeah, thank you. Yes, sign up. <laughs> yes. So thank you so much, Emma, for joining us today. It's been really fantastic talking to you and so wonderful to learn so much more about the origins of Grace and Abel. And um, yeah, and looking forward to an exciting future. It's wonderful working with you. Oh, I love partnering with you. And thank you for creating this space and this time for all of us, but for me as well. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks, darling. Have a lovely day. You too. Bye. Bye.